Hi, I'm Joe Johnson, and I'm the senior pastor here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, and I'm glad you're checking out our program, which we call His Kingdom Now. You know, when Jesus walked on the earth, he was clear. He didn't come to bring another religion. He came to open up a relationship with God through the kingdom of heaven. And the most amazing news about this is we have access to that kingdom just as much as he does. And so what we're going to do today as we open up the word of God is we're going to find out how the stuff works. We're going to learn what he said, how to cooperate with his kingdom so that all of us can walk with God and see amazing things, not just in this generation, but we can know for sure that we can live with him forever and ever. So enjoy the service. I look forward to talking to you at the end. Good. Are we expecting today? Yes. Uh, I would if I were you. Uh, a couple things before we get started. Okay, yeah, we're going to talk about election results. No, not the president, but ourselves. Uh, a couple things before we get into that. You know, they. Uh, uh, how many of you, you know, you've been with us here for a while, and I'm already warning you, I'm setting you up. So just go along. <laughs> All right, we're in a kayak together. You're not on the shore, so you're going to go for a ride with me for a second. How many through the years have, have heard uh, us believe, God, that we, Goffstown Harvest Christian Church is a mature church? Right, we're a mature church. Things that take out others, we're not, you know, we're, man, we're just going to stay the course. And, man, we're a bunch of spiritual adults and, and land takers and giants in the land and the spirit. We are mature Christians, right? All right, remember, we're, I'm taking you for a ride, and I'm setting you up. So how many of y'all believe that Goffstown Harvest Christian Church is full of mature Christians? Okay, how many of y'all believe you're a mature Christian? Okay, good. <laughs> I've got a question for you. There, are, uh, See if you can remember, you great theologians. <laughs> there were two, there are two very clear definitions of what it is that makes an immature or a baby believer. Two. All right, well, who, raise your hand if you can remember the first one. It's the most well-known. I'll give you a hint. It's in 1 Corinthians. What did the Apostle Paul say about who can, okay? Nope, not that one. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Yes, Sonia. Okay, not quite. Yeah, in other words, he said, well, it is. But he said, I wanted to feed you with meat, but you're not able. He says, are you not still so flesh run by this, the world? All right, that, and the demonstration that he gave of their childishness was how sectarian they were. I'm of Paul. I'm of Paulos. I'm of Billy Graham. I'm of Bill Johnson. I'm of Kenneth Hagin. In other words, one of the demonstrations of someone who has not matured, I'll stand still. Where's a good place for the picture? Am I good? Just keep doing because then it doesn't look natural. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so w one... Of the and it's very very clear. I wanted to, to I wanted to give you some really deep great stuff. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth, and and remember the church in Corinth still I mean, had incredible supernatural demonstrations. The apostle Paul said, "You're not coming short in any of the demonstrations, but you're still a bunch of babies." And the number one, there's two in the New Testament. There's two descriptions of what causes people or demonstrates their immature. One is they just, they're taking sides left and right. I'm of this, I'm of that. Fighting each other, disagreeing, not being of the same mind. So that was one. Who could tell me the second indication of babyhood and childishness as a Christian? I didn't think you'd get this one, but I'm here to help. The writer in the book of Hebrews said, by this time you ought to be teachers, but you have need again to get back on milk. If we're a mature church, we brought up announcements as far as connect groups. And right now, there hasn't been a lot of response. Life groups. And whether it's motorcycling or flying I declare we're a mature church, but mature Christians have groups of people they're discipling and teaching. They just don't come once a week just to watch. 
And I believe, see, I heard this one time, and this is way back when I was in, in uh, Bible college, and I would say that even for, we got some newer folks, I haven't gotten to know you yet, but I'm going to work on that one. But uh, to be honest with you, most people in this room know more than most of the world knows about the Word of God. Most of the people in this room we could pick up and drop out in the middle of Africa and you'd have a thriving church because you know more than they do. And what, so what I want to do is I want to instigate us to not just look for opportunities, but we'll be creating them going into next year. And again, we, it's, a, it's a different dynamic. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, some will have groups where, you know, you review some of the things we're talking about, but it's, a, you know, it's around likes and tastes and hobbies. I, what would stop me from having an aviation life group, connect group, whatever the heck they want to call it, okay? Because I get life group. Okay, can you guys all say life group? Life. Say it again, life group. Life. Pastor Joe is called a life group. Okay, boy, you were the loudest voice on that one. <laughs> but going into, going into January, and uh, I, I want to encourage and remind us, and yes, I want to instigate you, there's two indicate If we believe that we carry some sort of maturity, we'll be free from arguing and fighting and offense and deciding on whose disciple we are. But number two... We're able to handle the word of God. And even if it's talking about John 3, 16 for six weeks or something, uh, New England it has a famine of the word of God right now. They really don't know a lot of what's going on, and the numbers prove it. And if we are a mature church, and we are, then part of maturity is taking what we know and giving them to faithful people who will teach others also. Amen? All right, now... Didn't I warn you I was taking you for a ride? I warned you, right, but in January, let's, let's start getting ready. So are we ready to talk about and have a discussion as far as uh, the season we're in? Last week, we talked, of course, about uh, election 2020, and I talked about how important it is that we vote principally, that we stay out of parties and personalities, but that we, when we go into, when we went into the voting booth, and listen, it's not just done for four years, there's other things that are going on, but that we live principled lives. And, and that's one, what I really want to discuss today. I'm going to spend a lot of time just sitting here on the stool and have a conversation. I'm going to open it up again because there's just a few observations I want to talk to. But if we are going to vote our principles then whether we like what we see or we don't, then we still need to live our principles as well. And if, there's, if we do anything less, then we're hypocrites and we're guilty of what the world says that we are. We're not, now, I, we're not hypocrites here in this room. You know, people say, ah, oh, the church is all full of hypocrites. No, it's not. Next time someone says they're full of hypocrites, ask them, well, okay, name one. I love the look on people's eyes when they do that. And they say, oh, you people full of hypocrites. Oh, okay, well, why don't you name one? And they're just like the deer in the headlights look, okay? So, but as different things are going on, and, and listen, we just had, the, you know, the presidential race now, and, I, and I'll say this, that uh, whatever, ha I want, I'm, today our conversation is whatever happens. Now, there's some very intelligent people out there that are saying, you know, not so quick, I'm making a decision, there are some things that are possibly out there. Whether they are or not, uh, Jesus is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords, and he's the president of presidents. And what I want to do is I want to keep us balanced because through the years, and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today and really discussing has a lot to do with balance because... Um, we can really get off on high horses sometimes. And I, I, some of the observations that I've had, you know, Christians, we can look really stupid out there with some of the things we get off on. We just look stupid. And there's, some, and, and there's so many th different things we could talk about. But uh, I just want, there's just a few observations. And again, I just want to sit and, and talk with you some things I've observed. And I want to bring us back uh, to an anchor for our souls. I want to bring us back to a compass that lets us know which way is north, south, east, and west while all of these you know, different things are, are going on. And, um, you know, last week, you know, we quoted out of, and, am I doing good? Am I sitting still? It's good. 
Yeah, Rob was getting at me because sometimes I like to sit here and just rock when I'm at a chair. She goes, it doesn't really look good. So now I'm just being self-conscious. I'm just going to sit here. Okay, how am I doing? Good so far? Excellent. Okay. Uh, the scriptures tell us that our citizenship is from heaven. Look, our citizenship is from a domain or from a, um, a place that an angel can take something, hurl it to the earth and wipe out a third of it. See, we need to be reminded of where our home truly is and our resources and whatever. And listen, uh, we have... Oh, hi, Deb. Good to see you. We, we, we serve a God. Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you were having a real bad day and you broke out Caesar's writings? Or Diocletian? Or a Caligula? You know, those guys killed Christians. But when you're having a bad day, who, who opens up the writings of a small business owner and fisherman? Whose words change nations even today. And I don't want my job, or the discussion, the conversation that I want to have today is I want to keep our eyes in heaven where it belongs while things are working here on the earth. This is not, this is a discussion, not necessarily an answer thing, but I, I just, observations, and what I want to do, and what we're going to do today is, again, it's a discussion, it's not as much, I taught last week, and we went a long time, and again, today, let's just, a couple observations, let's have a discussion, and like we did last week, you know, we'll open up the floor, so while you're listening, if you got something really good that you think might be important to share, please we're going we're to invite you to do it. So. so how we came about today. So this is, you guys got your coffee? Everybody's all ready to have a conversation. This is, that's, that's the vibe for this morning. Uh, you're going to leave here and some of you are going to turn on Fox and MSNBC and all the news and all that. Uh, let's do this before you get electrocuted and wired and can't sleep. <laughs> okay. How about, how about the word of the day will be chamomile. <laughs> Lavender. <laughs> okay. So uh, observations. And again, so many things we could talk about. But these are some things during the election season. And, and even this week, I've noticed, like, you know what? Let's, let's just talk about those things. So this is where it all started. Up until yesterday, I really didn't know what we were going to talk about today. And uh, I've been a firm believer that, and you've heard me talk about this before. Well, pastor, uh, you know, it would be nice if we knew what series you're going to be on in three months. Uh, I can't do it. There's pastors out there that have outlines going a year. I can't do that. That'd be like my kids. It'd be like Christian going, hey, Ma, can you tell me what's for dinner the third week in July? <laughs> see, see, my job is to, is to, as your pastor and as your friend, is to, is to make sure I cook up and we have a meal that we need that day, the nutrition that we need that day. And I really wasn't sure where we were going to go until... Uh, yesterday morning, I was, you know, I was in the Word of God, and I wasn't reading to study. I was reading to be with my God. I wasn't get, trying to, I didn't want a message. I just wanted to be with my God. And so I was reading the Gospel of Mark, and, and I went past this, and I, and I really felt, go back. And so based on this, this is where we're going to go today. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verse 1, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days. This is speaking of Jesus. And it was heard that he was at home. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now, we're going to finish uh, this historical account here by, at the end of the service. We're going to come full circle. But what was going on is, you know, and I had read that, and there's, there's a couple principles in there that we, you know, we could talk about. But I had an opportunity to... Um, uh, had to get some lawn work done. Do you believe it's 70 something degrees in November? Guess who's going to be back out in the woods this afternoon looking for Bambi? I got a big eight point out there that's got my name on it. Oh my God. Usually after two hours, you're freezing. The little packet things don't work. Everything. I'm out in a short sleeve shirt just lounging out in my stand yesterday. Going to do that again this afternoon. Praise the Lord. So anyway, while it's warm, I was getting some lawn work done. And as I was praying in the spirit, and what, that, what I mean by that is uh, the, the older term is praying in tongues. I was praying in my spiritual prayer language. And a certain thought, and some of you have been on social media, uh, you saw that. And so based on 
some things. This is where we're going to go. So our first observation. And Lacey, I would like you to have that on uh, the internet at some point. You don't have to do anything else to it but this. And this is, if you saw on uh, uh, Facebook, uh, this is what came to my heart as I was praying. Disappointment is not the same as no faith. But losing one's faith as a result of disappointment is another matter entirely. And so the first observation and things that I've seen and heard, and again, you know, being in the industry and, and flying again as well, I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people outside of church and listen. And I'm telling you, people are losing their minds right now. And even Christians, they're like, and, you know, Glenn, we were even talking about, you know, and, in, in, you know, and the prophet said, and God said, and, and QAnon said, and who, how many of y'all familiar with QAnon and all these things that are coming in and supposedly with the CIA and some people think Mike Pence is doing all these ideas that are out there. Well, a lot of folks are up in arms right now. And again, the media doesn't decide who the president is, okay? And uh, I'll, I'll say this, um, that I do believe it's in my heart that something really great is going to happen. Now, the, but the Spirit of God has never told me it's about Donald Trump. See, one of the things that's important that we recognize is, and maybe this is, I'd like you to develop this. If you don't have this phrase in your vocabulary, please put it there. Have the phrase, you know, I just feel. Or I sense versus God said. You know, there's a lot of people out there running around going, God said that are going to be in a whole lot of trouble. And, let, and I'll share with you as, as, just, as, just, as a spiritual father, as I've watched through the years, coming up on 40 years, um, you know, walking with the Lord, 35 years in Pentecostal, full gospel ministry, whatever you want to call it. What begins to happen is the moment you label something God said, you begin to feel forced to make it happen, whether it's happening or not. And what it'll do is it'll skew your vision to see and say things because it has to be what God said. And uh, I'll be honest with you, the last time I used that term was about a year and a half ago, and now I'm flying again. I knew that. And it took six ministers to tell me, son, you need to get back into aviation. But after that, you'll notice. I'm very careful. And I want to, uh, if we could cultivate here in this church um, an honor for the things of the Spirit. I, I believe that Christians are too flippant with the gifts. I think we're too flippant. It's like every five minutes, someone God has said. And we can get into a lot of trouble. And th those kinds of things can wreck churches and whole ministries and right now there's a lot of things that are out there and what i'm hearing and there's some i'm hearing some exceptions and they're bringing in the word of god but to be honest, and again my experience this is why we're having this conversation a lot of folks are depending their faith on what the prophet said or the q anon said not it is written and so what i want to do is i want to bring us back so my first observation is is there something we can anchor our soul on more than QAnon or the prophet? Yes. We also have a more sure word of prophecy. And you will do well. Who wants to do well? I do. And you will do well to pay attention to it as it to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises. And above all, say above all. Okay, so he's going to tell us what he's talking about here. So above all... You must understand that no prophecy, does it stop there? Of the scriptures. The scripture. Look, tongues are going to pass away. Prophecy is going to pass away. Jesus said his words never pass away. And I appreciate, and do I believe in prophecy? Of course I do. I, of, course I, of course I believe that. And of course we've seen it and experienced marvelous, marvelous gift. But my friends, I'm watching, I'm watching people's faith get shaken because they're believing the word of a prophet instead of being able to revert back to it is written. And notice what the apostle Peter, what Peter was saying here, uh, that no scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. Now, for the sake of time, the context was... Uh, Peter was saying, look, we believe this stuff because we heard and saw him. We were on the holy mountain when the Father in his glory said, behold, my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In other words, in Christ, 
Christ was the ultimate demonstration that the scriptures are absolutely true verbatim. That's what he was saying. And didn't we say that last week when people say, well, you know, you don't believe that, you know, some boat and an ark and Noah? Absolutely. Well, how can you believe that? Because Jesus rose again from the dead and he was seen. The resurrection, these guys, and the apostle John did the same thing too. The veracity of what we believe is based on the resurrection and eyewitness accounts. And so what he was saying here is we have the ultimate demonstrations that the scriptures are absolutely true and that there isn't even a comma or a period that had anything to do with what the guy thought about it. The illustration that we've used many times here is, like, well, no, you know, how could that possibly be? Well, one of the illustrations that we give a lot here, and it's been a while now, um, how many of you all have ever had, now, Ralph, okay, you just came out of surgery. How are you doing? You look good. Okay, yeah, they worked on your ticker, right? On your heart, your valves and stuff like that. Okay, now, did, uh, did they do that um, through some tube or something, or just they cut you open? Yeah, they opened you right up, right? Okay. Now, uh, when the doctors opened you up and did their surgery, did they just come out from cleaning the garage and taking the garbage out? Okay, no. Nope. Not only did they scrub up really good, but did they have anything on their hands? Yeah, they had surgical gloves, right? Okay. Now, so you think the doctors did a really great job, right? Yeah. So here's my question. What would we think if after the doctor took the gloves off, they heard the gloves saying, wow, look at what a great surgery I just did? <laughs> See, when we, what we need to understand is, is that God uses man in the same way. And that certainly it, was, it would appear that it was the glove that was touching him, but every movement was being guided by the surgeon. And what we have here, as we find out, is, is, and this is how this can happen. This is why we can know there is not even a single thought of private interpretation came. These guys were so right and so possessed and so used surgically that God endorsed these things as his word, and it cannot change, and it can never go wrong. And so I want to encourage you, if you're upset, losing your faith, frustrated in any way. And by the way, you know, um, when we step back and we watch things, I've, I'll tell you, there's just something about God that, that, that whole exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think stuff. And I want to encourage us, even as you're seeing things go on that you might not think is what the prophet said or anything like that. We have the word of God that lets us know it's going to be so good. And even if Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden, Caesar himself, and all the persecution, they're going to bring us into a socialist wasteland and everything. If we're citizens of heaven, we already saw that as devastating as things were on the earth, they had incredible revivals. Incredible revivals and demonstrations of the Spirit. So am I disagreeing? Do I believe something amazing is going to happen? Yeah, but it's going to glorify Jesus, not a political candidate. Jesus is going to be glorified. And if things come out, it's going to be good because it's truth, not because it's simply about people. Okay? How many of you recognize that movie? Yeah. It seems that many folks are more educated in conspiracy mysteries and vague prophecies rather than it is written. And if I can encourage you, because you know I'm watching the stuff on social media and listening to people talk and so on and so forth, and again, I've thrown out just a, a couple of, 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 of these sources, I want to bring us back to let our comfort and our counsel be the scriptures, the word of God, and what Jesus has to say about things, not just the current prophet. I had a friend, a good friend of mine, uh, send me a video, and I'm glad he sent it to me. And it had this, this one fellow who was gener you know, known as a prophet, and supposedly, even this is back in 12 and 14, supposedly talking about President Trump and so on, and all that may be fine and good, Well, this, but this fellow was also wrong at times too. I know for a fact he, he, he's missed it. Even Brother Hagin would say, maybe I missed it. Okay, We see through a glass darkly. And I, again, I appreciate, and as I watch this video, and this is one of many things, I watch them trying to apply 
reality and what we're experiencing through the voice of the prophet. And in a 28-minute visitation, I didn't hear one, it is written. And that makes me nervous because we, we're living in a day, I contend, that fewer and fewer people really understand the scriptures, but they're really good at winds and waves of doctrine and different things that come down the pike. Not here at Goffstown Harvest Christian Church, right? Okay. My second observation. So now, and, and uh, if you know, if you've been around me any amount of time, I absolutely believe a Christian should be involved in their culture. I believe it with wholeheartedly that we should be involved in our, in our society. We should be involved in the PTA. We should be involved in elections. We should be involved in all of those things. We're the salt of the earth, and we should make it salty. I absolutely, 100%. But again, wanting to bring us back and to see things maybe from a higher perspective, this set, here's the second observation. This is Jesus choosing the 12. And he appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. You know, Jesus probably has a nickname for you, too. He just loves us. You know, this is why in the book of Revelation, what's it say? He says he's going to give you a name that only he knows. He's got a nickname for us. I mean, he's affectionate. He's got, just like I got nicknames for all of my kids, noobs and boozers and goober and budster down in Virginia. Just, I got to have an affectionate name. Well, Jesus has names. Now watch, but watch as we continue who he's chosen. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Oh, look, Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is, and I do appreciate, and I, and I wanted to, through the years, you hear me regularly say we need to be aware of different things that are going on. But what's on... Lots of things I could have talked about, but the second observation, what's on my heart, is to talk about Simon the Zealot. Now, what I want to do is let's read it because some people may not know what, what that means and why that's in there. And I think it's interesting that Jesus picked businessmen, he picked tax collectors. And see, what, what we see here is when he picked Simon the Zealot, let's find out about what the Zealots were and what they believed. Flavius Josephus, how many of you are familiar with him? Jewish, very famous Jewish historian. And uh, um, he wrote prolifically. We know a lot of even secular people say, wow, there's no proof outside of the scriptures Jesus existed. Yes, there is. Josephus was one of them. There's other historians that totally bear witness to the life and ministry of Jesus. Well, anyway, he talks about what these zealots believed. Simon the Zealot, this is what he believed. Um, so Josephus lets us know that there were three main Jewish sects at the time, and we've heard of these, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Zealots were a fourth sect founded by Judas of Galilee, also called Judas of Gamla, uh, in the year 6, uh, I think it was B.C., uh, against the census of Quirinius, shortly after the Roman Empire declared what had most recently been the Tetrarchy of Herod Archelaus to be a Roman province. I'll stop there. What you're going to find out is the Zealots arose as political activists. Jesus took on a political activist into his 12. Now, you probably don't know where I'm going with this. Don't assume you do. Okay, He took on a political activist. And let's keep reading. Now, these guys were relentless to a fault. Watch this. And that they agree in all other things with the Pharisaic notions. In other words, they were God-fearing Old Testament Bible-thumping folks. Man, but they were on a mission. And I see a lot of Christians on missions today, political missions, zealous. But here's what we need to understand about the zealots. And, okay, well, I'll just read it and then we'll... Um, but they have an inviolable attachment to liberty, and they say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord, okay? But watch what they would do. These guys were political activists and reformers, even to the point of intimidation and bloodshed of their own people they felt were compromised. See, as a zealot, not only did they not want Roman oppression, and they wanted liberty, and they didn't like being imposed upon, but these guys were, the, these guys were if I, you have to take me in context, would use the tactics of an Antifa or BLM 
to intimidate. They say they believed completely, absolutely in the teachings of the Pharisees in the Old Covenant and God being God. But in the name of liberty, they spared no expense to get done what they wanted to get done. They were zealous for political reformation. And some would appeal that, hey, we want to bring back the Messiah. Now watch. When Jesus chose Simon, and this is where I want to go with this, he demonstrates to us there is a much higher purpose and much more grand and encompassing liberty to fight for than political power, as noble as that may be. And so my second observation is I'm watching all the Christian Holy Ghost political pundits go up and down, left and right, and how the country should run, and you know, and if he is the president, President Biden and Kamala Harris are going to throw us into a Marxist country and this and that. I've also noticed, and forgive me if I don't have the facts right, I know right now that there's Christians that blackball other Christians because they voted for Trump. I've heard that there's even churches that have people that have, well, I'm going to unfriend you because you voted for Trump and all this. Just relentless attacks on character. And we even saw that even before the election. Uh, everybody, this is Amber. So everybody just go look at Amber. <laughs> no, stay in here. It's fun watching your face. <laughs> I love this stuff. Okay. I have a, que I have a question for you. Uh, once, once Simon started hanging around with Jesus, do you think there was a never another indication again that Simon got involved in any kind of political movement outside of the kingdom of heaven and the souls of men? And I want to remind us as we're believing and as we're watching the news and we're hoping that we have a breakthrough in this or that and this person and things are going to be exposed. Listen, I, personally, I want whoever won to win because they won it fairly and squarely. That's it. That's it. And I'm okay with an argument if potentially that didn't happen. I actually don't mind that. But I'm also reminded that as sons of the Most High God, that, and again, as someone who believes we should be involved and so on, Simon the Zealot left political activism and became part of kingdom activism. And that there was a higher calling. And that his issue was saving the souls of men, not reforming the political government. And I want to bring us back to that. And I want to remind us that at the end of the day, whoever's the president or not, if someone's outside of Christ, they're going to hell. Well, why do you believe that, Pastor? Jesus never taught about hell. Oh, yes, he did, number one. And number two, why do you believe in hell? Because Jesus died, rose again, okay? He taught about it. The, the apostles taught about it. There is a such thing as a hell. That's why. And I've presented many times before, if there was no such thing as hell, you want to tell me why Jesus died on the cross? I mean, really, why would he die on the cross if there wasn't an eternal punishment to try to stop us from going there? Okay? So while we're being zealous for wanting what's right in our nation, can we please keep in, in our hearts that there's a much higher calling than who wins the presidency. And this gospel is going to go forward no matter who's the president. I don't care if Karl Marx is resurrected. I'm preaching the gospel. He has nothing to do with Kamala Harris or President Trump or nobody else has anything to do with whether I'm the salt of the earth or not. It has nothing to do with it. Simon the Zealot found that out. Quote Charles Finney, I quote him regularly, if there was anyone who believed that society needs to be influenced by the gospel. But let's remember this. There can be no higher enjoyment found in this world that is found in pulling souls out of the fire and bringing them to Christ. And so while we're bloviating and expounding on high on all of our social media and going back and forth and listening to people, can we remember that we actually have a much higher an exalted position, and that is to herald the greatest news that's ever been sent to a creation, and that is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay? Last observation. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Say good works. Good works. Okay. 
let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about it. So there's two things. Now, Titus was one of Paul's spiritual sons, and he sent him to Crete to uh, set in order, plant churches, oversee him. And he really had taught, and there was a couple things he really dealt with Titus about. Number one, you know, establish pastors. And that area, and each area, you know, people are people, and when we congregate, different areas have different issues. Well, in Crete, and the Apostle Paul said, yeah, this rumor is true. They really are. These were very lazy people, and they were busybodies. They were lazy. They didn't like to work. They didn't do a lot of good things, but they had big mouths. And as my pastor uh, used to say, their mouths, they were so big that they could sit in the living room and lick a spoon in the kitchen with it. <laughs> okay, now that's a gossiper. And so he was talking to his people. Now notice there's two things, and I'll tell you why. This is where the observation, where this comes in today and in, in what we're talking about. And you yourself be an example by doing good works and then teach the truth. So the Apostle Paul says if, you, if you're active and doing the right things and your doctrine is right, you'll shame those who are outside. Now why am I bringing that up? My question to folks, and I, I want to pose this here to Gosstown Harvest Christian Church, um, are you active politically and socially three months before a presidential election, or can you go back a year and a half and still show your good deeds in the PTA, in your town, in your community? Politicians are not our knights in shining armor. We cannot expect them to replace our own personal and civic duties. The reason why I go back to this is I want to encourage this church. Whoever wins the presidency, we still got a high school over here with teenagers that are going through issues. We still have broken families and homes. Uh, Gosstown Gust, and that's not a demeaning term. I heard someone actually thought I was that was a demeaning term at some point. That's the average of Gosstown. The average Gostonian uh, household makes eighty thousand dollars. I think they have two and a half children, and so. And whoever is the president, you're still going to go over to Hannaford. You're still going to Sully's. You're still going to drive downtown in Manchester and see people with needles by their arms. And what I want to encourage us, and I trust that, though, that those of us here at this church and those of the people that we're talking to, that, that our angst and zeal isn't a once every four year event. And that we have social conscience 36, 365 days a, a, a year, every year. And it's, there's powers, you guys, there's powers that be that their whole job is to stir you up and to agitate you. And see, here's the thing. When you're agitated, you don't think clearly. And, I'm, and remember, these are observations. These are not indictments. I'm watching Christians get all riled up about an election, and you won't hear anything from them in six months. And they'll just go back and live in their caves. And I want to remind us that, listen, President Trump or President Biden or anything, they are not the savior of America. I'm glad that they can steward certain things, but if our citizenship is in heaven, we're being called on to, be, to serve our communities and to be active participants much more and not let our politicians do the job. Some of us are going to be upset because we hoped someone else would do what you and I are supposed to do. I'm glad that there's public policy that we declared and international stuff. And I look, that stuff's true and it's right. But President Trump, or if it's going to be President Biden, they're probably not going to come and sit with the sick person here in Gostown. They're probably not going to put together a little community thing here to help people in New Boston and where. They're probably not going to join the PTA over here. They're not going to work in the high school as a volunteer. They're not going to do these things. And so what I want to do, third observation, let's not be zealous once every four years, every election. Let's be people that are zealous for good works all the time. And if we belong... Uh, if, if we're sons of the Most High God, then the Word of God lets us know we're supposed to continually be doing good works. When was the last time you did something good for anybody else besides yourself? You know? 
We're supposed to be really practiced at these and also know what we're talking about as well. So, so full circle. And this is where I want to leave us today. And this is, uh, these are the principles that I want to have here at Gosstown Harvest Christian Church. And I'm going to take us back to, I only read us half of what happened, that event in the Gospel of Mark. And this is what I came back to yesterday and what I want us to have here at this church. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was at home. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when Jesus, now this is the rest of the story, or the event. And when Jesus saw their faith, said he saw their faith. Does Jesus see our faith or does he see our unbelief? He saw their faith and he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. He arose and immediately picked up his bed, went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Notice a couple things. Notice that, that Jesus, so here he is at home. It's almost like the guy never had a day off. He had to go escape just to go get some peace. So here he was at his own house, and what began to happen? All the people started to come. As a matter of fact, so many people, you couldn't even get into his house anymore. And I want you to, and, and listen, the zealots were still there. There was still political oppression. There was still unbelief. There was still blasphemy. There was still bad doctrines. And what did Jesus do? He preached the word to them. Number one, he preached the word. Then, and, I, and the word, remember I told you I was, I was reading and just go back and this, this one word really stuck out to me and created this domino effect. Just one word. The then. Say then. then. Okay, what is the then a result of? Folks, it's going to be very, and this is why even back to some of the things we're watching, the then is a result of hearing the word of God, not QAnon or a prophet. Or, and I'm glad for all that. Understand what I'm doing. He brought them back to the word of God in the scriptures. And when the word of God is simply taught and simply preached, there'll be thens. And see, this is why it's important to get in an atmosphere of the word and the local assembly. And uh, starting in January, in these, what are they called? Life groups. <laughs> Help me with that, because I'm going to get yelled at every time I say the wrong thing. These life groups, the conditions were set so that this part, we don't hear of anybody else getting anything. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of Luke, when it says the same account, it says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal, he was the only guy that, ever, that walked out of there, even though it was there, would have been there for everybody. See, if we can anticipate when we get into the presence of God to the hear the word of God, that we would, this is, maybe this is my day. And I get it. There, I've read books. I've got libraries left and right. And I've read books. It's like, okay, that was good. But then I thank God for those moments where I read one sentence or one paragraph where all of a sudden the entire book was worth it. Goffstown Harvest Christian Church is going to have the atmosphere here that people can have their thens. And they're only going to have that because we're preaching the word of God, not conspiracy or guessing or American treasure, whatever that movie is. I swear, you guys, I'm listening to Christians talk and, and they've turned this thing into this mystical mystery hunt with these prophecies instead of, listen, the scriptures are clear, they're concise, and when you see the word of God and it declared, you knew exactly what it was talking about. And we look ridiculous because we make it look like we're these treasure hunters just looking for this crystal ball that's going to tell us maybe. Listen, I pray in tongues in 10 minutes. I can have God download a whole lot of really good stuff. No mystery about it. Goffstown Harvest Christian Church is going to be a church. Thank God for all the gifts and the offices, and I believe in all those things. We are primarily, remember, living principally. 
We're going to preach the word of God. And I can't change it. I don't want to change it. Why do we not change it? Because he died and he rose again. And if that's true, it's all true. We'll just say what it said. And we're going to expect that people will hear and they'll have their then. And what happened with the then? We'll see faith and we'll get to watch God do amazing things. Okay? And so that's where we'll finish today. We voted principally. We must continue to live principally. We're going to preach the word. We're going to expect faith and then watch God do what he does best. And that's make people better. Those are our principles here, and those were my observations during this time. And so now what I want to do is, I just had, wanted to talk, and I'm opening up the floor for anybody if they want to say anything, be respectful, and if someone says something you don't agree with, you're going to be respectful as well. But uh, I know I touched on um, just a few things, but these were observations I felt were very, very important and that to bring us back to, he preached the word, it evoked faith, and God did something really great. And with all this stuff that's going on, it is written is much, much, much infinitely more authoritative than QAnon or a prophet. Amen. <laughs> Why don't we let's let's stand up uh, and let's let's pray for our nation. And uh, I'll be clear, and now that I've got us all anchored, this is now Joe Johnson talking. Um, there is evidence that there was cheating. There's no doubt about it. Okay? And, but our prayer is, um, and I remember, and you've got to understand, too, where I'm coming from. I learned this years and years and years ago. If, if the man of God has a capacity to have angst and hate against someone... God can't use them in those gifts, especially if he wants to minister to them. So I will not go there against the Democratic Party. I'm not going there against the Republican Party. I'm not, but I can believe in righteousness. I can believe that, and there have been those with clout in the spirit that have declared that this, things are going to be exposed. But I am not going to go where things are exposed, therefore crucify that person. Because if I think like that, he could never entrust me to minister to that person one day. I won't take that upon me. And this church is not going to take it upon them. We want what's right because it's right. Okay, not because someone has something coming to them. That's between them and God. But we can absolutely, and I do agree. I do agree with those that are speaking now that I'm talking personally. There are, we're going to see some really amazing things in God. I, I'm convinced of that, and things are being exposed. And, but again, if, if, if Mr. Biden wins, let's let it be because it's an honest election. And, and we will pray and support him, and we're not going to go on crusades about conspiracies. We're going to thank God that we're going to preach the gospel. And if there were injustices and Mr. Trump wins again, President Trump, then we're going to rejoice in that as well. I'm going to despise Marxism and socialism, okay, and injustice and all of these things, no matter who's president. I don't need a president to be my cheerleader. I just need the anointing of God to make sure I can heal and touch people. But if you're looking for, and this is this church, but I'm not going to because if someone, or if you're watching, yeah, I'm waiting for it because I can be very vocal. There's no question. I have my opinions and, and convictions. But this was not a day where I was going to talk about one person being so evil and one part. Where that's, I, he's not going to be able to entrust me with the powers that I, I believe I'm called to walk in if I have a capacity to get into partiality and angst towards someone else. I can't. And this church won't be able to. Anybody should be able to walk into this church and know they're going to be touched by the presence and the power of God, aside from any affiliation. He can't, he's not going to trust us with that because then you begin to steer, try to steer the voice of God versus letting him just say what he's going to say. You feel me? Yeah. Let's pray for our nation. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you and I praise you. And we join together with all the prayers of the, the saints here in the United States of America. And I'm familiar, even those around the world that have been praying for our country. <coughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we trust you. Not a fatalistic whatever will be will be. We know that we're called to bind and loose. The church's responsibility is to preach and declare and bind and loose. We're supposed to be active in these things. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we agree right now that righteousness will reign supreme in our nation. And Father, that you will expose any injustice. Father, in Jesus' name, that you will put an end. And it doesn't really matter what side of the aisle, just end the injustice that our nation could shine, that our nation could be that beacon hill again, known primarily as, as, that, as that country that sends forth missionaries and finances the gospel, that our people would be in peace. Uh, Father, I just want to thank, and that wisdom would come across the body of Christ. Father, some of your kids just have looked ridiculous and really given you a bad image. Uh, Father, I just pray that a great maturity would come across the body of Christ and that we have a more sure prophecy in the word of God, that we're known for the word, we're known for faith in the word of God, that Jesus is president of all presidents, and that we're going to see his name glorified. Uh, but Father, we do want to see uh, 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 righteousness reign here. We genuinely do. And I pray, Father, that if there's any kind of, uh, that that would be a prayer of go get them, God, because they're our enemy. Lord, let us just die to that stuff right now. Your name is glorified when things are right. It's up to you to take care of those judgments. We'll declare the word of God. We'll believe in righteousness. And we're going to trust you to touch this great nation. You know, President Trump rightfully won, then Father, establish it. If Mr. Biden rightfully won, then let's establish it. We're going to establish it. We're going to be faithful. We're going to trust you. And Father, we're going to believe until Jesus comes back, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand now. In Jesus' name, and everyone says Hi, this is Pastor Joe again, and I trust that you enjoyed our service. I believe that you learned more about God, you learned more about His kingdom, that you understand more of His word. And at the end of the day, what makes that amazing is we can walk more close with our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if there's anything we can do to serve you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Of course, our Sunday morning services are at 10 o'clock. Our information is on the website. Please make sure you check it out. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you, serving you, journeying together with you in this generation to see the goodness of God now and forever and ever. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you real soon.